The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Welcome everyone to Lessons from the Gulf, which is a program organized by the University of Chicago's Center for International Studies and Program on the Global Environment. My name is Meg Matthews, and I'm the Sustainability Coordinator here at Shedd Aquarium. And on the aquarium's behalf, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming. Uh, we're extremely proud to be hosting this event, which obviously is on an issue of tremendous significance, not only to us professionally in the aquarium world, but also personally. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ruben Keller from the program on the global environment. Uh, again, thank you all for coming out tonight. We know that it's a, uh, that it's a, that it's a school night, so it can be tough to, uh, to get away from home. So on behalf of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the Program on the Global Environment, uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this World Beyond the Headlines event. The first thing that we need to do is to thank The Shed once again for working with us to put on an event like this. We held an Asian Carp event here in April, which was a huge success. And we're really pleased that, uh, that the Shed is willing to, to continue working with us. And we hope that this relationship will continue. And through the Shed, we also need to thank the, um, the many very capable staff and volunteers at the Shed, and indeed in the program on the global environment, who've, who've made this happen. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Ihor Lahowski is an environmental ecologist, uh, environmental biologist, and ecological risk assessment assessor in the environmental science division at Argonne National Laboratory. So he began his career as a, as a terrestrial ecologist and he's moved more and more into ecological risk assessment. And being a part of the Department of Energy obviously gives him a fairly unique insight into these trade-offs that need to be made between uh, ecological systems, which can also be the sorts of systems that we like to extract our energy from. Dr. Lahowski holds a PhD in zoology from Miami University. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, hopefully, this will be an interesting presentation. Uh, when I was approached uh, uh, about participating, I, I was trying to think, what could I do? What could I talk about on this topic? And at Argonne National Laboratory, where I work, uh, a lot of our programs, a lot of our activities are supporting doing work with Department of Energy and other federal agencies tackling energy issues in terms of both developing plans, programs, um, figuring out impacts, what could be done to avoid impacts, what opportunities there are for alternatives for energy production, and so on. And so I've um, had a bit of experience uh, uh, with offshore energy development here in the US with work I've been doing recently with um, the former Mineral Management Service, and I'll talk about them in a few minutes. So what I thought I'd talk about uh, in this introduction is basically what, why are we in the Gulf in the first place for oil and gas? Then how do we get oil and gas? What's involved in the steps? I mean, everything in the news has been all focused on the spill, the spill, the deep water horizon, the spill. Well, what goes on? Is this, you know, how, how much oil and gas development is occurring? What's involved? What's a seismic survey? All those kinds of things happen in oil and gas development and marine systems. All those things have potential impacts. Spills obviously have the, the biggest potential and the ones we're most worried about. But I want to give a, a kind of a background uh, and give you a, a feel for what's going on in offshore energy development for oil and natural gas. And then touch briefly on what are some of the ecological risks. Again, I'm going to focus, I think, primarily on risks from normal operations, normal activities, okay? Um, you're going to hear subsequent speakers after me talk about impacts associated with these big catastrophic spills. But I am going to touch a little bit on, on some of that. So um, if we look at energy production in the United States, or energy consumption, I should say, regardless of what sector we look at, whether it's uh, in, in, in the industrial sector, in uh, residential heating and, and use in our homes, in transportation, you look, this is, just covers the last 60 years or so, continuous, I mean, obvious trend upward in energy consumption in our society. 
Okay? There's minor blips here and there, but obviously the trend is going up. And everyone fully expects this trend to continue into the future. It's not going to magically level off and go down and, and we're all going to still be able to have the same kind of lifestyles that we currently have. So energy consumption is expected to continue to, to, to be rising uh, here in the United States. Where is the energy that we use coming from? Um, this is uh, this chart here on your left. Um, identifies kind of the major categories of energy pro production of fuels, I guess. So you've got coal, natural gas, crude oil, uh, renewable energies like solar and wind down here. And um, just a relative, you could see that the majority of the energy produced in this country, at least in 2009, came from the big three fossil fuel energy supplies, coal, natural gas, and crude oil. And natural gas and crude oil, when you combine those together, they're a little bit over 40% of the energy, um, our, our energy comes from the use of um, oil and natural gas. If we look at what's happening just at the oil side of this picture, okay, because I mean that's prim primarily what we're concerned about here in the Gulf and this, this topic with the oil spill. Since 1950, again, our oil consumption in this country has been steadily increasing, okay? If you look at what's been happening with our production, though, here in the U.S., early on in the 50s, 60s, up to about 1970, we had a continuous increase in production of oil in this country. However, that level of production wasn't matching our consumption, and as a result, we were having to import oil from foreign sources. About mid-70s and so uh, up to about the mid-80s, oil production in this country kind of leveled off, and since that time, it's been declining. We've been using up the oil reserves that we have. Uh, the Alaska pipeline, they're talking about in the next 10 years, it potentially running dry. The North Slope, those oil fields are going down and down every year. Uh, okay, um, the inland uh, oil fields, like in Texas, on those places, are, are, are slowing down. And as a result, even our energy consumption is going up, and as a result, we're having to import more and more oil. Uh, to meet that demand because our, our national production is decreasing. Okay, so where does the Gulf, what role does the Gulf play in, in our energy production, uh, energy um, sources and so on? Two charts here, if you look here on this one, again on your left, if we look at how much oil is being produced in the Gulf relative to production in the entire United States, the Gulf accounts for about 25%, to fully a quarter of all the oil that's produced in this country. Okay, and for the last several years, it's been averaging uh, around 450 million barrels of crude oil per year. Okay, so almost uh, roughly a quarter of total U.S. oil production comes from the Gulf. This figure on the far side here um, talks about oil reserves in the Gulf. And what we're talking about are the referred to as proved reserves. Proved reserves are oil deposits that have been identified. We know they're there. We know where they're at, how much is there. We have the technology to get them. The regulatory environment's correct. But, uh, and the economics are correct. Oil costs enough that it's profitable to go get them. We just haven't gotten them yet, gotten to those yet, okay? The Gulf has about 20% of the U.S. total of proven oil reserves, okay? And that's about 4 billion barrels of oil. Uh, that value varies depending who's doing the estimates, but that percentage is pretty good. The Gulf also has a similar amount, about 4 billion barrels of unproved reserves. These are oil deposits. We know where they're at. We know how much is there, but the economics aren't right at this point. We don't have the technology to effectively get at that oil, but we're expecting somewhere down the line, oil prices keep going up, technologies keep getting better, we'll be able to get, get at those, okay? So the Gulf both accounts for a lot of our national oil production and also holds a significant amount of our yet-to-be-tapped oil reserves in this country. So, talking about how we access the oil in the Gulf. I want to give a little background on the environmental setting for the Gulf. So here, you know, here's the Gulf of Mexico, and three really major components here that, that we want to deal with. The first is referred to as the continental shelf, 
and that's this area surrounding the Gulf in light blue. This is relatively shallow, extends some distance from shore depending where you're at. Where you're at. The characteristics are relatively gentle slope and it goes down to a water depth of about 600 feet. Okay? Then we have the continental slope, that's this kind of intermediate area here that's all ruffled. This is the place now where the shelf, it's been gradually going down and now suddenly it starts dropping off much more steeply. Okay? Here the water depths range from 600 down to about 10,000 feet. And you can see in some places that continental slope is very steep, uh, in others much more gradual, but still. Uh, so we go from 600 down to about 10,000 feet. And then finally the last area, these abyssal depths, these are areas that are greater than 10,000 feet in depth. The deepest spot in the Gulf is about 14,000 feet, and it's in a trench here in the Western Gulf. The average depth in the Gulf is about 5,500 feet. Okay. Why is this important? Well, you'll see oil development, oil and gas development in the Gulf has start, oops, let me go back, started here on the shelf and is slowly moving down into the slope areas. Oil development for U.S. Coast uh, offshore areas are managed currently by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Regulation, and Enforcement. This is the new agency that used to be the Mineral Management Service, MMS. Okay, that's what, this is what they've been uh, rebadged as. Okay, their responsibility is for managing outer continental shelf and slope U.S. waters in the Gulf, on the Atlantic, the Pacific, and Alaska. So all our federal offshore waters for energy development, okay? In the Gulf, what they've done is they've divided it into three planning areas. The Western Gulf, that's about 44,500 square miles. The Central Gulf, that's about 103,000 square miles. And the Eastern Gulf, about 100,000 square miles. They manage these areas under a five-year oil and gas development program. The current one, started in 2007, expires in 2012. They're just getting ready to start putting together the 2012 to 2017 plan. In that plan, they identify which areas of all the outer continental waters they're gonna open up for oil and gas development uh, and, and what kind of requirements industry might have to go into those areas. So what happens here is, here in the Gulf, um, what the Bureau has done is they've basically subdivided those planning areas into what are called lease blocks. And these are what they offer in auction to the oil industry, to the energy industries. Different companies bid on those lease blocks and the winner pays the bureau money that goes into the federal treasury and then that company has the right to go into that specific lease block, do exploration if they find oil, then develop it and bring it to market, okay? so. The, the Gulf's been divided into just over 29,000 of these lease blocks. And they have, they're about three miles by three miles, so about nine square miles each. Okay? So now where in the Gulf, I mean, I mean, do we have energy development and oil platforms all over the place in these, in these blocks? And if we take a look where active wells are at, uh, we see a pretty interesting picture. Most of the active oil wells that are out there now, and there's just about 500 in the Western Gulf and about 3,400 in the Central Gulf, most of them are in that shallow, in that continental shelf region. Why? Well, oil development in the Gulf started in the late 40s, probably even earlier than that, but really was going, started really going in the late 40s. It was obviously easier to go into shallowest water to tap the oil, and as you started running out of oil in those shallow areas, Start going deeper and deeper, and technology is helping you do that. So we started out, you'll see in a slide in a minute, a lot of development as close to shore as possible, and then as you get into deeper and deeper water, fewer and fewer developments. There's nothing in the east, eastern Gulf, um, for the last program, the one before that, and probably this next one that's coming up, there's been a federal moratorium. Um, there's no oil and gas development at all allowed in the Eastern Gulf. And that was from political pressure from um, the state of Florida with regard to protecting all of its you know, pristine beaches for tourism uh, for that industry. So um, basically the, the 
the bulk of the eastern uh, planning area is completely off limits, so there's no development there at all. We look at where natural gas production occurs, a little different diagram, but the same kind of thing. You could see both in the eastern gulf and the central gulf, the majority of, of uh, natural gas producing sites. Uh, these are all indicated by these red dots. The bigger the dot indicates a bigger amount of natural gas coming out of that one spot. Okay? So again, this represents the 200 meter water depth, so that's 600, 700 feet roughly. So most of the development you can see is on that continental shelf. Okay? And only some of it now is moving out into the deeper waters on the continental slope. As I mentioned, oil and gas development in the Gulf started out in these very shallow nearshore areas where at the time with the technology, that's what we were able to get to. Okay? As these fields started drying up, new ones are being found, new technology was coming on board, development started moving out in the deeper and deeper waters. Um, over 50% of oil and gas development now of, of, um, uh, of leases, okay, and there's about 7,800 total active leases in the Gulf, over 50% now are in water depths greater than 1,000 feet, okay? Almost 30% in water depths greater than 5,000 feet. And that's a pretty recent event. We didn't really start getting into these deeper waters until the early to mid-1990s, okay? Uh, in fact, in 1992, there were only three deep water, greater than 1,000 foot depth, operating oil rigs in the Gulf. Um, uh, by 2008, there were 31 active rigs, and those 31 rigs accounted for about 18% of the total U.S. oil production in 2009. So very, very productive wells in these offshore areas. Ecological impacts of oil and gas development. Um, what could be going on? Um, and as I said, I really want to, I'm going to talk about normal operations and impacts associated with that and less so on the catastrophic spill event. And we'll have, a, a, our next speakers will, will discuss that and I'll touch on it a bit. Um, but basically oil and gas development anywhere, whether it's on land or, or uh, offshore, deals with four phases. You have exploration, construction, operation, and when it's all dried up and done, decommissioning of that, that well and that platform. Okay, all of these activities have some sort of ecological impacts to, to various resources, okay? In addition, in the Gulf, you know, we've, we've got a lot of oil and gas development. He'll, he'll show you some of this stuff here in a little bit. Um, we also have a lot of human impacts going on from all sorts of other things that also have to be taken into account. So you can't just focus on oil and gas development. We've got tremendous amounts of wetland loss from filling coastal development, taking away uh, barrier islands and, and, and beaches and so on, commercial and recreational boating activity, um, water pollution from rivers. We have the anoxic zone, uh, you know, the dead zone off of the, the Mississippi Delta, uh, agricultural runoff coming in. The ecosystem in the Gulf is being challenged by all sorts of things. Oil and gas development clearly is one of them, and a spill the size of, of um, um, the deep water horizon um, it is uh, you know, re really a major activity here. Uh, and I've got five minutes to go, so this is gonna have to be pretty quick. <laughs> um, in exploration, uh, what happens here is you have a survey vessel that has a sound generating device. It sends high, uh, high level sound waves down. They penetrate the ocean floor, bounce off of different surfaces, come back up, are picked up by microphones that are towed behind. And this lets the uh, exploration people develop two-dimensional and three-dimensional images of the subsurface to help find those, those areas. And here's a picture of what that looks like. Here's a survey vessel with uh, the generating device behind. And each one of these little wake points represents the location of one of those underwater microphones that are picking up the reflected sound. Basic issues here, there's some concern about vessel strikes, so this could hit a whale, a, a marine mammal, a sea turtle. You know, uh, that can happen, it's not a, a big issue. A bigger concern is the noise generated by this uh, the device here itself. Um, if an organism is directly below one of these guns, the sound pressure levels are so high 
They can cause damage to hearing, to, to ears, and so on, and actually cause physical damage to the body. Uh, so it could actually kill an organism. But it would have to be pretty close and un directly underneath this, uh, which isn't that likely. More important is the noise that's generated, the frequencies that are used, could interfere with marine mammals and other organisms. You know, marine mammals use sonar and, and, and vocalizations to communicate, to track prey, to avoid predators, detect predators. Some of the frequencies here could easily interfere or have the potential to interfere with those kinds of activities and could cause uh, some ecological effects uh, as these surveys are going on. Uh, in construction, once we find um, a, a field, um, they'll go in, they'll put in a, a well, and then uh, impacts associated with noise from drilling, from wastes, a variety of, of items here. Here's some um, just schematic diagrams or uh, diagrams of different types of oil uh, and drilling platforms in shallower waters down to about 1,000 feet. Um, most, many platforms are firmly attached to the bottom, okay? Once we get out beyond 1,000 feet or so, clearly out beyond 1,500 feet, most of the platforms are these kind of semi-submersible. They float, okay? They're anchored to the bottom by a handful of cables. In some cases, you might actually have a drill ship that just anchors and stays in place using different propellers and, and, and water jets in the hull to, to stay on place. Um, these then drill the wells on the, the seafloor bottom, and um, uh, if they're drilling platforms, um, often when they're done, they move out and then a production platform comes in and takes its place. This is actually the Deepwater Horizon rig, okay, as it was being transported to one of its locations. And so this, you know, this would be submerged to about here in the water. This is hundreds of feet tall. Some of these platforms weigh upwards of 50,000 tons. Um, so gigantic, um, um, just an example of what one of these looks like. In addition to the platforms, you got to get that oil to shore. You got to get it to market. And of the 4,000 or so active platforms in the Gulf right now, they're supported by about 33,000 miles of underwater pipelines that run from these various platforms to onshore facilities. These pipelines in deep water are generally just laid on the bottom, but when you get into shallower waters, uh, what they prefer to do is trench and bury them in the bottom, and you can see this obviously would be impacting bottom habitats, affecting local water quality, at least temporarily. The intent here is, in shallower waters, you run the risk of people dropping anchors, puncturing your pipeline, ships accidentally ramming it, um, tidal surges from storms lifting a pipeline up and rupturing it, so the, the burying, this trenching is really intended to help protect the pipeline from outside sources. And then once the pipelines get on land, um, there's some sort of um, facility that collects the, either the oil or natural gas, processes it, and then sends it onwards to refineries. So obviously wherever this is built, whatever wetlands and things were here are long gone. Um, uh, minor leaks and things can occur from out here. So there's, there's impacts associated with this aspect of oil and gas production. Operations. Pretty much, unless there's an accident, not much would be going on. Some noise, there's some concern of bird strikes, just like we have here in Chicago with migrating birds striking uh, um, uh, our skyscrapers. There's some evidence that actually migrating birds use these platforms when they're crossing the Gulf uh, in extreme storm events, and they actually land on them, arrest, and wait out the storm, and then continue. Uh, and finally, decommissioning. Um, the deeper water platforms would just be towed away to a different location. In the shallower water ones, especially ones that are attached to the ocean bottom, uh, they'll basically go in and remove all the materials that's above the water surface, recycle that material, reuse it elsewhere. Then the towers that are left, they go in under water, cut the towers, and just collapse it in place. The, perf the more, most common approach for doing that is using explosives, and here's just a, a photo of one of these explosive uh, these detonations going off. Obviously, that's a big concern for sea turtles, marine mammals, and fish that might be in the area. Uh, when this is done, there's a very controlled monitoring program. They look to make sure certain animals aren't within certain distances based on the charges that are used. So very, very careful in doing this. And these platforms then, here's one in California that was, uh, uh, was dumped. A lot of these become these rigs to reefs once they're in 
um, on the seafloor, they get colonized by uh, aquatic organisms and become attractants for fish and become habitat. Um, accidental spills, and I, I think I'll probably finish with this one, and I'm just about done. Um, you know, we, we had the Gulf spill. We have to also keep in mind that there are other sources of oil into our marine environment. Uh, Natural Resource, Resource Council, uh, in a study back in uh, 2002 on oil in the marine environment, estimated in North American marine waters to get about 1.8 million barrels of oil being put into that environment. Over 60% of that comes from natural seeps just coming up out of the seafloor. Okay? Oil and gas development production was estimated to account for only 2% of that. But then we look at the Deepwater Horizon spill, 4.3 million barrels. It's about two and a half times of what was estimated in 2002 for all of North American marine waters. This was all done in, what, four months period in one location in the Gulf. Okay? I don't know how many folks know, but we had an almost as big spill in the Gulf back in 1979, the Ixtoc one spill off of Mexico. This one ran for almost 10 months and put out three and a half million barrels of oil. Okay? So in both cases, these single catastrophic events way surpassed what the estimated average for the entire North American marine environment done. And it's these oil spills, these catastrophic ones, uh, that we're really concerned about. When you look at uh, the, the records for oil spills that the Coast Guard keeps, uh, the majority of the spills in the Outer Continental Shelf in these marine waters typically were less than 10 barrels in size. The biggest ones were in the 1,000 to 2,000 barrel uh, activity, okay? Something along this size uh, outside of the uh, spill in Mexico in the 70s, this had never occurred in U.S. waters, and they've been doing oil and gas development since the late 40s in, in that area. Um, accidental spills, I think I'm going to skip this. We've got a presentation in, in, that's going to cover this in, in detail. Um, and so just in, in summary, you know, U.S. energy demands are increasing. No one argues that. At the same time, our oil, and our oil supplies are decreasing, okay? Unfortunately, we all drive cars, we all use gasoline. We need, you know, our country uses that, and, and where's that, that oil coming from? The Gulf of Mexico here in the U.S. represents a really major source of that oil that's produced here in this country, okay? Um, both in terms of what's there, um, the shallow reserves are declining, but there's a lot of reserves in the deeper water, and that's where industry is moving out into. So we're having more and more facilities, things done similar to um, the Deepwater Horizon um, uh, site. Hopefully we're not going to have those kinds of accidents uh, um, happening in the future. So um, for oil and gas development, impacts with, with all different aspects of development, but really the biggest potential for the greatest ecosystem injury and damage really is associated with these catastrophic spills. You're talking four million barrels in a short period of time in one location. Um, that, that's a, a really major concern. And uh, with that, I'll end. Thank you, thank you. Our second speaker tonight is Dr. Ilza Berzins, who is from here at The Shed, where she is the Executive Vice President, uh, and, I, and I'll see if I can get all this right. She's got a lot of titles. Executive Vice President for Animal Health, Conservation, Research, and Education. So that means that she's in charge of the teams that look after the 32-some thousand animals here at The Shed and the conservation, research, and education programs. Uh, she has quite a unique perspective into, into marine oil spills uh, be, because she's a marine biologist and a, uh, and a veterinarian. So we're really excited to have, her, to have her presenting tonight. She holds a PhD from University of California at Berkeley and a DBM, a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from University of California, Davis. Thanks. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us on a school night. I don't, I don't think I've been in school for a while. Um, 
I also just really wanted to thank my co-presenters on this. They aren't here this, this evening, but uh, a lot of the information that I'm going to be talking tonight is, is information that they've been involved in. And Ken Ramirez, who heads up our husbandry uh, staff, executive uh, VP for animal collections and training, and then one of our uh, certified veterinary technicians, um, Mayala, who we did send down to the Gulf. And so some of the information I'm going to be sharing is, is, was her experiences for the two weeks she was there. And so just an overview of what we're going to present, um, history of sort of some of our involvement with some other oil spills, just sort of uh, how response rehab is organized and run. Uh, basically from a perspective of a veterinarian treatment and care for the animals and then some of the hidden impacts uh, in the ecosystem and then a few success stories. A lot of times you don't really associate success with an oil spill, but there can be some um, highlights there. Um, just again, some historical perspective, some of the major oil spills, uh, and, and as our, our speaker, as Eor had mentioned, some of the, with the deep horizon around four million, the, the um, Mexico spill around three million, and just a few of the others. Uh, I think in my memory, I can re also remember the Exxon Valdez um, one. Um, and these are four that SHED had sent staff to uh, with varying um, involvement. We actually have some animals on exhibit from the Valdez. Some of our sea otters um, are still from that spill. Um, they were pups, and we couldn't release the pups back into the wild since they imprinted on uh, their handlers. And so we've had them since that time about 20 years ago. And some pictures on that. Um, and that oil spill response, uh, many types of spills we've talked about. Um, there are drill site spills, transport spills, uh, storage site spills. So it does happen. I mean, and like again, as Eor had mentioned, we do have, we utilize it. So we do uh, have to sort of deal with the consequences. In a response, kind of the stages, you know, stopping the spill. That's what we sort of have been working on, focusing on, uh, or the last several months on stopping that spill. Um, these guys are sort of coded here. Uh, containment in terms of all the booms and in terms of the dispersants or just sort of and burning it, how do you contain that spill? Uh, the wildlife rescue, what um, animals are being impacted and, and how do you organize um, groups going down to help with that? Uh, then the cleanup efforts, not only for the animals but for the environment. Um, you know, soaking, sopping up that oil. Um, and I know in the Val Exxon Valdez, they were using pressure washers, which again, sometimes seemed effective and actually in, in um, retrospect may have actually, you know, not have been as effective, but trying to contain that. And then types of cleanup, we, we hear about um, biomedi biomediation in actually adding organisms to the water. And, and there actually is a uh, several bacteria that do utilize the oil naturally. And we've actually seen an increase in the bacteria in the water in the, in the Gulf. I mean, again, from the natural spills, you have it, uh, bacteria that evolved to utilize that. And they are starting to see you know, an increase in, in sort of their helping naturally degrade um, the oil. Some of the talks, though, can you seed some areas you know, with the bacteria? I think the balance, the concerns are if you're seeding it, they do utilize the oxygen. Do you create some dead zones be, because of it? So you sort of have to balance that. But it's just, to me, it was very fascinating that there are species out there that make use of oil as their food source. Um, burning and some of the, there are different types of oil. And there are some components that will burn off readily. But then you have concerns about what's being released into the environment and the air. The chemical dispersants, we've heard a lot about that uh, in terms of helping sort of disperse that. But then, you know, how, how it, it doesn't necessarily impact on the, the shoreline, but you might have problems in the water column dredging it, skimming it, absorbing it, and then some talks of vacuuming and even centrifuging. I think they were bringing in, um, or they had consulted with, who was that movie star that had been in Waterworld, but they had created a centrifuge system. And actually, they were actually serious. They had been looking at it. They could centrifuge the oil on top and the water below, and some, again, just techniques to identify how to separate that out. Uh, and then in a response, um, so stopping it and cleaning it up, and then just the replenishment. Once the, it has been stopped, the oil's been, been um, cleaned up, and then all the efforts that are out there to uh, restore, uh, reha you know, repopulate, rehabilitate uh, damaged areas. And a lot of organizations become involved in that as well. <laughs> 
And then obviously, of course, there's the investigation. Everybody wants to find out what had happened. And so there are lots of different um, um, stories and, and uh, panels looking into that. So that's kind of just the sort of the steps in a response. But I'm going to talk to you from the perspective more from a veterinarian uh, and wildlife rescue in these catastrophic spills, what's involved. And first of all, to identify and locate where um, animals are. Um, and I know everybody wanted to just get down there. They wanted to help every, but, but the thing is, is that you needed to have it organized. You had to properly identify which groups could go out, how to properly handle the animals. It was phenomenal with all the interest to help, but you also have to be trained to be able to help. Uh, and then, you know, I try to find them and how to even bring them to the shore. So once you, you do have the groups arranged, and we'll talk a little bit about the sea turtle response that happened down there, but then you have the triage, which ones really are going to make it, which ones are not. You do have to make those decisions. You know, this, is so, this animal is so badly damaged, it's much more humane to euthanize the animal as opposed to trying to put it through the process of um, rehabbing it. And so there'll be those decisions made by the, the health expertise that's there. Um, then the animals needing to be cleaned up, they have the oil and you have to make decisions about how heavily are they coated, how stressed are they, do you immediately try to treat them or do you try to stabilize them? You have to sort of assess how stressed that animal is. Sometimes you do leave an animal alone for a while even though they're coated and you want to have this response where you want to clean it up. But they are wild animals, wild animals are stressed. They've already been handled, you've been transporting them. Sometimes you have to make the decision, well, it's probably better to leave them alone for uh, several hours or a day before you really try to go clean them because then they can kind of regroup and then uh, handle your, uh, the next steps uh, further. Again, some you can um, deal with right away. And I, many of you um, probably have heard this, but one of the more popular cleaning uh, tools out there is to utilize Dawn, um, the dish detergent. It, it's a biodegradable, but it's this phenomenal uh, source and actually Don quite often donates cartons and cases, you know, to rehab efforts. So quite often you are scrubbing the birds and the turtles um, using Don. I think it's good for your hands too, but I think you know you're wearing rubber gloves so to help that. Once you do have the animals, you do have to assess what sorts of treatments are needed um, and identify who's going to be treating them, how often, where are the supplies coming from. And then it's not only just that immediate. Some animals we can return back to the wild. We have to assess how damaged is their environment. Can they be returned to that, that, that area? But then there's some that have to have long-term care. Who's going to be taking those animals? And, and where are they being sent to? And there's the Zoo and Aquarium Association, AZA, which is, is a national um, affiliation. We all, you know, we'll talk about the sea turtle, but we talk about who had space and who could, who could accommodate this and who could we send these animals to who needed this longer-term care. And, we'll talk, and the penguins, this was in South Africa with the spill down there, um, just thousands of penguins. And they weren't damaged, but their, their habitat was. And by, they had to clean up the habitat before they returned the penguins. So they had to create these pools you know, for the penguins um, before they could return them back to the wild. And again, just tubs for turtles. And then again, some animals are permanently damaged that you don't return them back to the wild. And again, you have to make the assessments um, you know, again, how damaged are they? Do you euthanize them or are there placement opportunities that you can then again uh, house them, utilize them for exhibit and education purposes and also to tell the story? I know, isn't that cute? Aw, that's, aw, come on, collective aw. So call to the action, this is the most recent one in the Gulf. Um, we worked again with AZA, which was the Association for Zoos and Aquariums. Dr. Joe Smith sort of really uh, was sort of the head person put in place coordinating. There's over 244 zoos and aquariums that belong to AZA. And we have really started a pool together, unfortunately for catastrophic events, especially after Katrina, you know, what is that network? And, and really sort of creating teams that can respond and kind of that interconnectedness throughout the country. Uh, we scheduled, uh, they were scheduling veterinarians and technicians for two week commitments through October. And we sent our technician, but then we also, and, and our, one of our zoo, zoo residents, uh, Kim, went down. And the other doctors on staff, myself, helped with some of the um, logistics as well as um, in terms of some of the treatment regimes um, and assistance that way. 
So talk a little bit about, so what are some of the things that, some of the concerns you do have for an animal that is impacted with the oil? Uh, you think about, first of all, contact um, problems, skin, feathers, fur. Um, the oil can be uh, burning and can kind of irritate the skin, creating ulcers, erosions. You think about the birds, they do have a waterproof um, capacity. That they have their own type of oil, but it helps waterproof their fur, uh, fur for their feathers. But the other stuff will, can impact and they'll start to lose that buoyancy. And also then they have the heat loss problems. Lungs, gills, um, they can aspirate sea turtles, uh, marine mammals, uh, can aspirate some of the toxic fumes. They can clog the gill filaments. You can have ulcers on the eyes. GI tract, once the animals start to clean off or try to clean off themselves, they'll ingest it when they're preening or grooming. And you'll ingest that there could be obstruction, their irritation. And then as the compounds become metabolized, then you can have, unfortunately, other damage to organs, liver, renal damage, kidney damage, dehydration issues. And then also you can also have bioaccumulation over, over a series of, of years as it sort of accumulates. The base of operations for our... Um, for the sea turtles that we responded with was conducted down at the Audubon Nature Institute down in New Orleans. And for those of you who've been to New Orleans, the Aquarium of the Americas and Audubon Zoo, but the facility that we were working on were the aquatic center. It's then down the river a ways and they, that the boats would come in after they'd been searching on the Gulf and bring them into the aquatic center. So this is sort of a view of the aquatic center. And, we, and so this was the, the base of operations for sea turtles. There were marine mammal facilities, there were also bird uh, facilities, but we, sent, we, we worked with the sea turtle area. Four species were impacted or that we worked with, Kemp's, Hawksbill, Loggerhead, and the green sea turtles. Predominantly were the Kemp's and the greens, those are the ones that we would find in the Gulf. And the receiving line we would set up, uh, receiving and as, the, as the animals were being brought in. Boats would go out in the Gulf in search of animals all day, and then they'd come in around four. They'd have called in ahead of time how many of the animals they had, the, the veterinarians, the staff, ready to um, do the triage and, and then uh, and start kind of processing them. During the day, they weren't sitting around waiting for the turtles to come in. They were already dealing with all the turtles that had already been brought in. So they would get up at early in the morning, 7 o'clock, take care of the animals already there, and then be there at 4 o'clock to now process the animals coming in. So. Each animal does receive a medical chart, um, a photo, an identification uh, tag on them, um, and then sort of the intake line. Processing, they would get the first rate. We would draw bloods if we could, if the animals didn't need to sort of have uh, that time to de-stress heart rates. We would take respiratory rates that were to baseline where the, how that animal's doing, checking for ulcers, and if they could handle it, their first bath or their scrub bath. Um, so most of the average animals were actually smaller, uh, around one kilo, um, a couple of pounds worth, maybe a dinner plate size. So we had a lot of smaller turtles that we, that were, deal that we were uh, working with. Uh, we can draw blood. There's a nice uh, vein up, up near the neck. So we do draw bloods, just like you go to the doctor. They want to see you know, what, your, you know, what your blood looks like in the sense of your white cell count or your red cell count. You know, are, are there issues chemistry-wise? Uh, we would check heart rate. This is a Doppler. It's kind of a, a, another type of stethoscope, you know, kind of picking up the pulse to see you know, what their rates might be. This is the first bath. He's getting a little toothbrush scrub to get the oil off his shell. Uh, and then we just sort of had tubs and, and um, uh, pools all over the place um, with turtles floating everywhere and building more. They would build more as they would come in. Each animal does have its separate record and medications that we gave first round would see what they needed and then we'd kind of assess whether they needed vitamins or, or antibiotics, if they needed more baths. Sometimes you'd, we'd feed them oil to help pass so they'd kind of lubricate their GI tract so they could pass any oil that they might have ingested. Um, so daily care was during the day just taking care of these animals. Uh, we did have to swab out their mouths because they'd had ingested some of the oil. And then bedtime, we you know, sort of put them to you know, rest, uh, and then they'd start the next day. Some animals, we were also dry docked. They just were so weak they couldn't swim, and so we actually had to prop them up on towels um, so that 
they could breathe. Um, and then this is just kind of on one day what the intake was, live animals coming in that were oiled, uh, ones that weren't oiled, and then mortalities. This is just kind of a daily tab that they would keep on the different species. Yes, there was press down there um, to kind of cover it um, on that. Um, so habitat, so that's kind of what they did, and Maella did, and they've done since, they finally did wrap up um, in October. And I'll show you some of the, the stats on that. But different habitats can be affected. It's not just what we see on the shore. It's the surface waters, the water column, especially when we started adding these dispersants, the bottom, you know, in terms of what types of animals might be impacted. The beaches, we always, you know, in the wetlands and the estuaries, and then if you burn, some of the air also can be impacted. Uh, and again, there's a direct thing we know that impacts the animals, but other things that were happening in the Gulf, spawning events, fish spawning, releasing eggs, they float to the surface. And if you've got surface oil, you'll lose that spawn. Uh, the turtles, we'll get back to the turtles here in a minute. Some of the dispersants, you know, when you start to break it down, some animals started to ingest that because they were small enough size, so there are some potential toxicity issues. Oxygen depletion, just smothering, surface exchange. And then also from this oil spill, there's a lot of methane gas that was being released, which is a higher com composition than in, in typical areas, and so there's some issues there. A survey, and then it's also, we, we hear about the turtles and the birds and the mammals. Those are the three things that come to mind. But this is just to show you the numbers of species that, in a survey, were at the Gulf. Over almost 16,000 species have been identified in the Gulf of animals. And we really don't have great information on how some of these others were impacted. But just to remind you, there's other species out there than just those, what we call the mega charismatics. As of November 2nd, there is a website I have at the very end to tell you, kind of tell you how many birds were found alive, how many were dead, how many total, so about 8,000 birds and so far about 1,200 have been released. The sea turtles, about 1,200 have been uh, found, uh, about 400 have been released, and the same with mammals. But we don't have any information on fish or the invertebrates at this point in time. Success stories, I know I'm at five minutes or even less, but very little. We, think about can be talked about the success, but the, um, let me, let's just kind of tell you what uh, sort of has happened or, or some of the things. So X and Valdez, 400 animals were rescued and released, and 31 uh, animals found homes. Um, and then, like I said, we received uh, some of those animals, and of course, there are a lot of science studies that kind of be followed. You don't really necessarily want to do those studies, but it provides an information to follow through. Um, this is the one in South America, I mean in South Africa, when you had about 19,000 uh, adults, 10,000 chicks, um, and like I said, their habitats were be impacted, so we needed to move the birds, so the, about 19,000 animals from that. 91% of entire African penguin population was handled in that spill, and then being able to be released and saved, which is phenomenal. We sent a couple of staff to help that. Can you imagine seeing that many penguins? That'd be a riot. Unfortunately. Uh, deep water horizon, one of the things that we are happy to hear, one of the big concerns was the brown pelican is on the threatened list and they do breed there and the concern was that we'd have to, I think they would just gotten taken off the threatened list and we were concerned it'd have to be put back on the threatened list. But we, it seems to not have been as hard hit. The sea turtle nesting was in nesting season and so a lot of nests had been relocated. We'll talk about that. And then the zoos and aquariums, we really sort of really worked together through AZA, and it's still ongoing um, on that. So let me just tell you quickly about um, the hatchling story. Um, they'll emerge. The, the females come on shore, lay the nests, cover them up, and the hatchlings usually by August, September um, will come out of the nests and return to sea. Summer is nesting season. The females come on shore. They'll dig a nest cover it, and the mom returns to the ocean. And then all, this, all the sea turtles that we have are threatened or endangered. And we do have abilities to protect them with signs and everything on that. So we, and a lot of times, if you walk the beaches in the morning, you can identify where uh, a nest has been laid. So one of the concerns was that they thought that about 50,000 hatchlings might be threatened uh, on this. And AZA uh, worked with some of the state and federal agencies to sort of try to identify solutions. So one was, we'll do nothing. Uh, one was to do a Head Start program where you could bring them in and hatch them. And one was maybe relocate nests. 
Um, so they started to try to identify the nests, and unfortunately only found about 12,000 eggs. You know, they, again, you could identify them, but some of the nests had been like, you know, if the day goes on and the winds blow and you just really can't identify them. So they only, out of the 50,000 that they thought they would find, they've only found 12,000. Um, so one of the things that was very cool, a very, and this is, this is, um, Ken Ramirez, that several years ago he worked with Disney when they were doing some Florida work, and he, Ken is just a phenomenal trainer, and they, he learned, he trained dogs to sniff turtle nests, and they utilized that in Florida, and Ken said, hey, these dogs are still around, and so we re-employed, or, you know, kind of let's call them up like the U.S. forces, and said, let's, you know, can we utilize these dogs, and of course, you know, um, I don't know how many we found, again, that could do it, um, but we were able to find 29,000 additional eggs. Uh, these guys are happy as can be. We're finding turtles, turtles. And um, then we relocated. Um, and so far, uh, f about 15,000 hatchlings have been re-released. Re the nests were located to areas that weren't impacted by oil. So I thought that was kind of a great uh, story on that. So on the websites uh, for you, for if you want to keep following some of the additional information on animals and impacts. Um, and I just wanted to, again, you know, I'm very proud to work at Shedd Aquarium and, and, the, and the dedication that the staff here have and just working with a community of experts to help out there. But, you know, think of us also at one of those. So I guess we're going to take questions a little bit later, but so thank you. Our final speaker this evening is Dr. Larry McKinney, who is Executive Director of the Hart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies at Texas A&M University. And he's been working on uh, environmental issues and the environment of the Gulf of Mexico for a long time. And he's done this from, from scales at about as small as you can go. He's, he's done amphipod taxonomy, and anyone who's ever looked at an amphipod under a microscope knows it's getting pretty small. Um, and he's also done a lot of work more recently at, at much larger scales, and in particular looking at how humans and our resource demands interact with the, with the Gulf of Mexico and how we're, how we're extracting things and, and how that can lead to conflicts. So Dr McKinney holds a PhD from Texas A&M University, and we're really pleased to have him here today. He, he flew up from Texas for this. Thank you. Well, thank you all. You've been very patient. Uh, I think at this time in the program, I think I'm supposed to say uh, I'm the speaker you all have been waiting for. I'm the last one. <laughs> so, but, but anyway, I, I do appreciate the patience and, and my, uh, the, our previous speakers have really laid a great groundwork for, uh, for me to kind of wrap up uh, what we're talking about. In my, in my discussion, I'm going to talk uh, really focus on three areas uh, of the oil spill and how it relates to the Gulf of Mexico. One is how could something like this happen? Uh, secondly, is why should we even care? If you're in Chicago, for example, and any place around the country, other than where we live in the Gulf, and will the Gulf recover? So that's kind of the general theme that I'm going to take a look at. First, you get a small commercial from my institute. Our, our, our institute is located in Corpus Christi. As Reuben says, it's far, far away. Uh, but I didn't have to have a passport to come to Chicago. It's not that far away, is it? so it, it's, it's close. But our Marine Institute uh, is like many others. We have all the, the typical sciences, but what, what makes us a bit different is we bring in as part of our institute, economists, uh, marine policy experts, and attorneys, and look at the synergy that's built between bringing all these uh, multidisciplinary uh, groups together to solve problems and address problems. And clearly, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill was a, a problem worthy of, of our attention. It has taken up a lot of our time, more so now uh, that the spill is over with. We'll talk about that in a moment. But let's talk about something. how could something like this happen. Uh, complacency, basically, and I, I really uh, set the stage for this, is, is that uh, the oil, uh, oil, offshore oil and gas development in the Gulf of Mexico has been going on for many years. There's over 4,000 platforms out there, more than 23,000 individual wells have been, been moving. We've, we've dealt with this for many years. The industry felt very comfortable, along with everyone else, that they could handle this situation. But what has happened over time is that we've taken that same technology, perhaps, that's part of the question that we're trying to answer now, and as we moved out deeper and deeper, did we actually take the recognize that there's a tremendous difference in drilling for oil at 600 feet or 40 feet as opposed to 5,000 feet, and actually where we're looking now, 10,000 feet. 
And that's the question that uh, the Oil Spill Commission is looking at. Is this, did the problem with the Deepwater Horizon, is that a technological problem or is it, uh, or, or, or what? And we all hope uh, it's not a technological problem for the very reasons that I, I uh, pointed out is that we need the oil and gas from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we don't have any choice in that regard. So, so that, was, that was really what happened. Clearly, uh, we exceeded something out there, our ability to manage oil and gas development and accidents in 5,000 feet of water. We, didn't, we were not ready to do that. Our two previous speakers talked about the Ixtox spill. Uh, before Deepwater Horizon, this was the largest accidental oil spill uh, in the world. I happened to work on this particular one, one of the first oil spills that I worked on, uh, responded to and dealt with. And as I watched Deepwater Horizon develop, it was an eerie uh, a feeling of deja vu because practically everything that went on in Ixtoc happened with Deepwater Horizon. It, step by step, what they tried to do, they had, they tried, if you may not remember now, they built this containment cap, this big device that they lowered down to try to put on top of it. The Brits called it a top hat. Well, the Mexicans called it a sombrero, but it was the same thing. And so they tried all these things, massive uses of dispersants, all of these types of things, very similar impacts to sea turtles and birds and these types of things. Uh, by the way, as we talked earlier about the sea turtle work there, they tried to move eggs uh, in the Ixtox spill, total failure, didn't work at all. So I hope we're having more success this round. But the point being is that we clearly, over 30 years, this happened in 1979, we really learned nothing in between that time about how to deal with oil spills uh, or responses, be it technologically, or, or dealing with the environmental aspects of it. There, there was, we had very little, we had no new tools. We did all the same things. Then uh, a national energy policy that really has put the, put the, uh, the floor to the, to the gas, or the, the, the boot to the, to the gas pedal to move forward. And this is really based on a concern that has been the concern of actually every president in my lifetime, the last six presidents, looking at energy policy. Their energy policies are always a mixture of moving away from foreign oil and moving toward alternative sources. Today, we're looking more and more toward alternatives, but every one of those, every president has a national policy of moving away from the dependency on foreign oil. Well, if that's our policy, the only place that that oil can, that we're gonna find it in sufficient quantities to meet demands uh, is basically, is frankly, the Gulf of Mexico and deeper and deeper. Uh, and so basically this I issue of drill baby drill is very real. And so companies, our national policy has pushed uh, oil exploration out into the Gulf, and clearly there's profit to be made there too. So the combination of those factors has moved us at an accelerated pace to try to get at this oil, whether or not we were ready to do so. And clearly Deepwater Horizon made the point that we were not uh, necessarily ready uh, to do that. So why do we care? So what? Why do you care about the Gulf of Mexico? Why should you care about the Gulf of Mexico? And that's what I'm gonna talk about now. Basically. Uh, we're talking about the Gulf of Mexico accounts, and we talked about this, and there's different numbers. I'm going to quickly go through this because IR has done this, but we have a tr tremendous dependency on, on the Gulf of Mexico for oil and gas, and you can see the pipeline systems that grow out of the, out of the Gulf uh, around the rest of the country. Basically, the Gulf of Mexico is the gas station for this nation. Just uh, when Katrina occurred, gas prices went up 28% around the country, uh, and other uh, petroleum products went up even higher. So what happens in the Gulf of Mexico directly affects you in that regard. The Gulf of Mexico produces 1.3 billion pounds of seafood every year. It accounts for over half of all the recreational fishing that occurs in the country. Basically, the Gulf of Mexico yields more finfish, shrimp, and shellfish than the South and Mid-Atlantic, Chesapeake, and New England areas combined. If you're eating seafood here in Chicago, most likely it came from the Gulf of Mexico. If you're eating seafood on the banks of the Chesapeake Bay, 80% of that seafood comes from the Gulf of Mexico. So it's a huge uh, source, and basically the Gulf of Mexico, I say, is the sushi bar for the nation. <laughs> Something that many people don't realize is that most of the U.S. drains into the Gulf of Mexico, primarily through the Mississippi River, but, but others as well. 41% of all the continental U.S. drains into the Gulf of Mexico. And what happens is, in, in one particular case, because of the agricultural overuse of, uh, of, of, of fertilizers and so forth, we get this 
a nutrient over-enrichment problem that occurs now on a regular basis, the quote-unquote dead zone, it's really not a dead zone, it's a, a zone of very low oxygen that occurs off the mouth of the Mississippi because the, as the nutrients pour in out of the Mississippi River, uh, the natural system, the ecosystem there just can't handle it like it used to because of the man-made nutrients that are entering the system. You get huge algal blooms, plankton blooms, they die. Uh, you get oxygen reduction, all these types of things. You have these huge zones where there's very, very little wa uh, oxygen in the water, not enough to support fish and shrimp and crabs and those types of things. Uh, the last several years, it's been from five to 7,000 square miles, about the area the size of Delaware and, and, and a few of uh, those uh, New England states that are too small to really think about, but it's still a big area, five to 7,000. <laughs> Even in Texas uh, uh, issues, it's still a, a big area. Additionally, the Gulf Coast, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas make up four of the five top states responsible for the greatest surface water discharge of toxic chemicals in the U.S. You notice on one of those earlier slides, almost half of the chemical refineries are located around the Gulf of Mexico. Well, this is one of the results of it, uh, is that uh, a lot of pollutants go into the Gulf of Mexico. And those chemicals are, that the things that are produced in those refineries are all, all important to you. Everything we're seeing around here today, everything plastic that's in front of us, the seat you're sitting on, probably came from, uh, it was produced in some part from chemicals that came out of those refineries. So unfortunately, the Gulf of Mexico is not only the water filter for the country, it sometimes is the disposal for the country, and we pay a huge penalty uh, to, to do that. So basically, if you, uh, if you drive a car, you, you cool your home, you have, use any kind of plastic, you like cereal, bread, beef, pork, chicken, uh, you like to catch redfish, you watch wild, uh, wildlife, you have a stake in an economically and ecologically healthy Gulf of Mexico. What happens there affects you every day. Let's talk a bit about, about the Gulf, and so why is it even worth looking at? Well, people, there are some uh, folks that think the Gulf, and I've heard this statement before, that the Gulf is nothing but a big industrialized ditch. There's nothing there but oil platforms and those types of things, and why should we worry about it? About it? But in reality, it is one of the most diverse uh, ecosystems uh, in the world. Uh, for example, we have over half of all the wetlands in the U.S. are found around the Gulf of Mexico. 90% of the seagrasses, all the mangroves, and 35% of all coral reefs are found in the Gulf of Mexico. We have some of the most unique and well-developed deep water uh, communities, we'll talk about those in a minute, along the continental shelves. Uh, they have a unique species that you see no place else. Mixed in with all of this habitat are over 15,000 different species occurring all around the Gulf. Five species of sea turtles, 71 of sharks, 2,600 species of crabs and shrimp, 2,455 species of clams and snails and all that type of thing, 28 whales. It is one of the most wonderful places to work uh, that you can imagine. I spend many, uh, many days at sea uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and over the years, many months and years perhaps, and what you see there is, it can be incredible at times. I can't even really describe it uh, uh, to do it justice. But then laid on top of this was the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, the largest accidental oil spill now that has occurred anywhere in the world. Uh, and it was a, a tremendous uh, eco ecological blow to the Gulf of Mexico. And really a, a, an incident that was truly of ecosystem scale size of the Gulf of Mexico as a whole, where it occurred and uh, the potential for those impacts as it, we saw it develop over the months of the spill was clearly something that could affect the entire Gulf of Mexico as a whole. So it, was, it had huge potential, and that's what we're looking at now. As the spill developed, there was a conscious decision made by the command structure that is, we have so much oil coming out, we know that the oil is going to go someplace. What can we do? Where is the greatest damage could occur? The decision was made that the greatest damage from this spill could occur or could affect the wetlands of Louisiana and the northern Gulf Coast, that's where 20% uh, of all the seafood is produced, half of the wetlands in the, in the U.S. are there, that could have happened to those wetlands, is turning out, we think, probably didn't. The, the margins of those wetland areas were affected, but the, the oil did not get into the interiors. We'll not, we will not know that for sure until about next year, this time, uh, going through a, after, after we've gone through a full growing season, but we're looking good in that regard. However, Protecting those wetlands and those coastal areas came at a, a significant price because the oil didn't disappear for the most part. They did burn some, they did uh, collect some, but where the oil was dispersed, it basically dropped into the open ocean. The water column 5,000 feet deep and in the bottoms uh, around uh, the, the oil uh, uh, site, the spill site, and along the continental shelf. 
And the types of species affected there are of concern are things like whale sharks, the largest uh, living fish. Uh, in the middle of the spill, uh, we were out uh, in an area that was called Ewing Bank, which is about, about where this, this big fish is, uh, looking at, at whale sharks. But they tend to collect over the top of this, this very deep submerged bank. Uh, in one photograph, uh, we had 90 whale sharks. The largest whale shark was 30 feet, about the length of this stadium, this uh, platform here. Many others are different sizes. They are, like many species of whales, they are filter feeders. They are big skimmers, are what they're doing. And that mouth right here just sucks in water and plankton and those types of things and filter those things out. Uh, I was swimming a, 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 among these things. We're trying to put satellite tags on them. They're very docile uh, creatures. They really don't pay, they don't pay much attention to humans for the most part. I think we're too insignificant to deal with them. But then when you stick a six-inch harpoon in the side of them with a, a tag on them, that does get them excited, and you have to be careful. The, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I lost several, uh, I'll, you routinely lose your uh, mask and things like that because they do have a big tail. The tail is tall as I am, and once they whip that through the water, they don't even have to hit you with that, but they can roll you out of the way pretty easily. The problem that we saw at the time is that these uh, whale sharks were skimming along the surface of the water through patches of oil, just sucking oil in and not paying any attention to it. That we could not tell if they noticed it at all. So we have no idea what the impact on these whale shark populations are because when they die, uh, they don't float, they sink uh, immediately. So we will, we will be looking to, to that. Uh, the deep scattering layer. This is a layer in the mid-ocean that happens all around the world, but it's a, it's a concentration of, of uh, fish and shrimp and crabs that, that actually shows up on sonar and that moves, migrates. It's, the, it's considered the world's largest migration because this layer moves as, the, as night comes. It moves to the surface and then down. And so it... Uh, uh, it is something that, uh, that, we, that we see in the Gulf of Mexico, sperm whales through uh, that, that type of thing. So we're very concerned about, about those impacts. There are giant squid in the Gulf of Mexico that they feed on, so it's marvelous in that regard. Uh, bluefin tuna, this is the species most likely to be affected by the, uh, the spill itself. And this is uh, there, the uh, Atlantic bluefin tuna has two populations, one that spawns in the Mediterranean, one that spawns exactly at the site of the oil spill at exactly the time uh, that the oil spill occurred, and it's the only place that this population spawns. So, and this species is already reduced in population by 80 to 90 percent, and we're very much concerned that this is, if there's one species that could have taken a, 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 a dead shot on them, this, this might be it, and we'll find that out uh, soon. We hope that that's not the case. Also uh, located along the continental shelf uh, of these areas is uh, really remarkable communities of uh, deep water corals. They're not like coral reefs that you think about. They're solitary type of corals, but they occur all along there along with other organisms. Uh, these corals, here's a picture of, the, here's one picture of them here. These corals are very long-lived. Uh, when, uh, when Jesus was walking around Nazareth, this particular coral was about the size of my hand. Today, they're about the size of a bush, about my size. That's how old these things are and how long they've been there. Very sensitive. They were concerned about oil plumes drifting through the, uh, through, from the uh, spill, drifting along the sides of, uh, of these communities. We do not know how they were affected. Uh, we have an expedition that will be going out uh, in two weeks uh, with uh, uh, submersibles uh, to survey areas that we have been to before to see if, in fact, they were affected. Some of the preliminary work there uh, has been, it been encouraging. We're going to go and try to find, find it for sure. One other thing, just of interest, this little, this is a tube worm. These, interestingly, these little communities, they actually live on oil. There's natural oil that comes out, that seeps out of these bottoms. These communities actually use oil as, a, as a, an energy source, and this particular tube worm actually drills for oil, just like we do. It will drill into the mud and take, get the oil from these seeps and then use it as an energy source. So basically, will the, uh, will the uh, Gulf of Mexico recover? I'll give you the short answer. Yes, it will recover. But the way I kind of look at it is this, and the, the, the way we're looking at it now is like a concussion. And I use that term because it's been in the sports news lately about dealing with concussion, concussions. And I think uh, what we're talking about in the Gulf of Mexico is a very similar situation, that we're looking at a concussion. And typically you will recover from, from concussions. When you look at Ixtoc, this is what Ixtoc looked like in 1979. This was Padre Island National Seashore. 62 miles of beach looked like a paved road. It has fully recovered. It took that headshot, and so from that concussion, the Gulf has recovered. The concern, of course, is that just like anything, as you get more and more hits to the head, concussions can have 
effects that we don't really know yet and can have impacts to other things going on in your body. Uh, and so that's what we're concerned about here. Right now, I have two ships out uh, collecting, for example, looking at the bottom, taking bottom samples, looking at where the oil is, and we're finding oil there, and others have found oil there as well. Our concern is how toxic it is. Uh, I just got a call on the way up here. One of my, uh, some, two of my technicians have been at sea for six weeks, and they desperately want to come home. But I've got another six weeks of work uh, to do, and I don't know if I'm going to let them off the ship. So, but I got, I got to. So I got to find. So if you, get, if you all want to go to sea, come see me. I need some people that are willing to go out for six, six weeks at a time and ride around taking benthic samples. But that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> so some preliminary estimates of recovery and where we are. Let's take a look at that. On the, on the upper shore, upper coast, I think we'll see the recovery of the uh, wetlands uh, and the, uh, the fin fish and things up there. We'll know more about that next year. Uh, but that will, uh, that will probably, we'll see improvements in that in the next couple of years. Uh, what we'll see uh, in oysters and, and those types of things, we'll see wetlands and, and the birds coming back, uh, any impact, we'll, we'll see those coming back over the next uh, two to five years. Some things we don't know uh, where they will come back, and that's those deep water areas. That we're, we're still trying to assess that type of thing. Uh, mammals, sperm whales, and dolphins, we still don't know that. We've seen a, couple, we've seen a loss of a couple of sperm whales. Dolphins were certainly impacted. We need to take a look at what happens there. Uh, turtles, we talked about those. Uh, hopefully they will, but there's some concerns about those because they were right out in the, uh, in the middle of that spill. And one thing that we have noticed following the spill, that, that the numbers of jellyfish and men of war that are a primary food source for these things have seemed to have disappeared. We, we don't know. Uh, they're not there in the numbers they were. We can't find them. So we think they may have been, obviously would have been affected by the oil spill. Their main food source may have been uh, been severely hit. So that's something we're concerned about. Uh, these benthic communities, again, we, we talked about those. We don't know about them yet. The deep water corals, we're feeling better about them. Preliminary uh, uh, expeditions offshore are, are seeing these corals seem to be in, in good condition. We hope that that's true as we look at more and more of them. <coughs> Bluefin tuna, we talked about already. Uh, tarpon, that's another uh, a big species of fish. They're very long lived as they can reach lengths, lengths of six feet, uh, ages of 70 to 80 years. Uh, they feed in this area as well as adults. They don't spawn here, but they do feed here. So uh, that's a concern that we'll be looking at. Whale sharks, we talked about too. We just don't know about them. So at this stage, and I'll try to, try to wrap up uh, now, and I appreciate your, your attention. Uh, I do feel, although there has, we have taken a pretty good hit from this oil spill, I do feel um, that we will come back from it. We really will not know, obviously, for several years until we look fully at it. But the Gulf of Mexico is amazingly resilient. It is a system that's used to huge natural uh, variability, uh, hurricanes and floods and droughts. So the animals and the, and the ecosystem is adapted to big changes uh, within certain ranges, obviously. Uh, we have uh, animals that, are, that take advantage of these situations and can produce huge numbers of, of young and to replace themselves depending on the situation. We even have microbes, a tremendously well-developed community of microbes we didn't know much about till this spill, we know more about them now, that actually eat oil because this, there's over almost, uh, almost two million barrels of oil leaks out naturally every year uh, from these seeps. And so those microbial communities, not only at the surface, but even deep down in where it's very cold, seem to be very effective at consuming oil. So we, we're naturally, our system is naturally inoculated against these spills. So all these combinations of things give me a a good feeling for where we are uh, with the spill itself. The concern will be is that we have many other issues challenging, challenging us in the health of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, habitat loss, the hypoxic zones we talked about, climate change issues coming along. So the question, long-term question from this concussion analogy will be is did this spill uh, affect or accelerate these other stressors that really will tell us what the health of the Gulf of Mexico will be in the future? And that's what we need to be concerned with and I appreciate your time tonight uh, in listening to that, so thank you all. Well, thanks again to all three speakers. Um, we'll now open it up for audience questions. Hi. Uh, my dad's a clam farmer on the Gulf of Mexico, and I went home this summer um, to be there and see what it was like. It was really crazy. And my question is, given the scale, what's the point of animal rescue efforts? I think that from each one we can learn um, 
uh, you know, what, what might be techniques that could be effective, what uh, techniques aren't being effective. Um, I mean, I think there is that question out there. I mean, there's, there are a lot of monies involved in it. Um, but I think, again, it's that um, trying to identify, you know, we're responsible for the spill. And it's sort of a, to me, it's an ethical um, kind of a question. You know, can we utilize or can we identify some of the technologies we have to, to working with some of these larger species? Um, I think that in the long run, in terms of some of the species to save and, and um, continue um, habit, you know, inhabiting our, our areas, I think it, it is critical that we do attempt um, to save them. Just to add one, one quick thing on that, and, and that is, and, and I think that this whole ethical issue, I think that's really the driver. I mean, just when you're, when you're involved in that and see it, you, you, we, we should do that because we cause a problem. But there is a pragmatic side to it, too, is that many of these animals that are rescued, be it dolphins, whales, turtles in particular, every individual in many of those species, like the Kims, really are valuable mm -hmm. for the future. So if you can protect one, uh, they, they can make a significant contribution to recovery of the species. So in that regard, it's, they're very valuable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People can raise their hands uh, while an answer is being given so that the microphone can, can migrate to them. Hi. Good evening. Um, something that really wasn't covered is that the burning of the oil produces uh, pyrolysates and other toxins. Was any attempt made to uh, uh, monitor this level and the effect on the, especially on the phytoplankton? There, there were monitoring efforts in that regard. Uh, that data has not been released. Uh, I mean, it's still, <laughs> still being surprised? held uh, under the NERDA uh, part of it. I will tell you that one of the, uh, as we were sampling the benthos around the spill itself, uh, the, the bottoms at, at 5,000 feet. 5, at 5,000 feet, yeah. 5,000 feet and taking cores, we were surprised we actually found layers of ash in many of our samples from <laughs> that burning. It actually, the ash actually filtered down through filtered the water. Down. Down. The other question is that the, the effect of the dispersants should be primarily on the, on the plankton, both zoo and phytoplankton. Has that been monitored? Again, we don't know. They, they did take samples, Ouch. but they will not, they will not let the... the that's the base of the food web. No, it absolutely is. Uh, and, uh, and that's... And that's no monitoring has gone on yet? I'm not aware of what they did do. They won't, they won't tell us yet. Thank you. Hi, uh, sorry, thank you. Um, I was listening to NPR this summer and they had a long um, series on the, the Louisiana coast and how it's degrading and eroding. Um, and a lot of it is due to oil lines and things that are going through it. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to how the spill itself may or may not have an effect on that. And you said they tried to guard the wetlands um, and how that land loss is working with the, the ecosystem generally. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the, one of the severe problems uh, that we have to deal with in Gulf Mexico is wetlands loss. Uh, for example, during the time that we were giving our talks here, an area about easily the twice the size of the shed aquarium has probably disappeared. We lose tw uh, almost a football field of wetlands every 20 minutes. Uh, and this is due to several factors. One is the... Uh, the uh, um, dredging and redirection of the Mississippi River uh, to move that sediment offshore rather than into the wetlands that surround it that keep them, keep them alive. Uh, and also uh, the, the dredging uh, to access oil and gas. I talked about that, it, mm -hmm. that in order to get to those sites, those, those uh, canals have accelerated that, uh, that loss. So that's the main impact there. Uh, so how this uh, spill may or may not affect, I don't know if it's directly would be directly related to it other than as an ancillary type of thing, the, the types of things that are necessary, pipelines and so forth, to support that kind of activity Activity has had that effect. Yeah, um, any of that production, the infrastructure for the offshore development, I mean, they, they have to get that product to shore and all of that has to go through, you know, 50% uh, of the nation's wetlands. Um, that, that, that clearly is, is a, uh, one of the causes of wetland loss in the Gulf. Uh, how the spill, I think, um, as Larry, you mentioned, I think we dodged a bullet in terms of we didn't see the kind of extensive fouling of shoreline habitats that many of us feared. 
Uh, and that's probably because I'm guessing the heavy use of dispersants, which have their own potential impacts and concerns. Uh, but certainly we didn't see, um, you saw some of the pictures that, that, that Larry and, and Ilza and I had a few quick ones of, you know, miles of beaches and, and just coated with thick layers of oil and wetlands smothered with oil. We didn't see that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think we saw that kind of impact to wetland resources from this spill. And I think we just were lucky we dodged a bullet. But I think, too, just, you know, for us, that's visible in terms of what our shoreline is. I mean, and, but remember, we did, you know, there are multiple habitats that, that we, you know, are still trying to get, gain information. I mean, it's the surface, it's the water column, it's the benthic areas, it's the underwater currents that, um, all, you know, also need to be assessed. Hi. Um, it was mentioned a couple of times that we are still going to be drilling for oil in the Gulf. That's a, that's a reality. Um, also that we didn't really learn anything from the Ixtox spill in 1979. So from an ecological perspective, what can be done proactively to prevent or better deal with something like this in the future? Um, we'll have all... <laughs> I I'll let, I'll let our thinkers he'll have a better answer than I but and, and that way I'd make that point is, is and I use this in some talks I tell people so, you know everyone is entitled to their opinion of whether or not we should drill for oil offshore water I mean that's that's an opinion but the fact is and I showed you those graphics that unless we are willing to make tremendous sacrifices uh, otherwise we're going to be and no matter how fast we move to alternative sources and we all should but at the most optimistic rate we're going to be dependent on oil and gas through all of our lifetimes in this this room and so we have to figure out how a way to do it. And I think the fixes are several things. One is technological. That we got, we, they're, they're, we're, they're clearly technologically, uh, we need to look at issues to make sure we don't repeat something like this again if we can help it at all. Uh, the other is better uh, knowledge and response. Uh, one thing that didn't happen from Ixtoc, after Ixtoc was done, there were many studies put forward and they all, as soon as the spill was capped and within a few months, all the funding disappeared and, and those studies were never completed. So we didn't learn much from that. So there's a lot to be learned from this bill uh, that we should incorporate so that when accidents happen again, resource agencies like EPA and NOAA will have better information to make decisions about what they should or shouldn't do, be in use of dispersants and, and those types of things. We need that knowledge base so they can make the best possible decision and reduce the risk. And I think I also just point, you know, I'll, I'll go down to the individual level. I mean, I think as, you know, as individual choices. I mean, you know, we are, we, we are a very fortunate society, but some of the choices we, we do start to need to be paying attention to what we choose. It maybe sounds like a broken record, but, you know, you really need to kind of assess what you choose to do every day. Um, you know, did you take the bus or did you bike or did you drive your car? Um, those small, if you multiply that by all the millions that live in the states, you know, you, that, that can impact it. So it's sort of the awareness programs of what your individual impact can be as well, I think is very critical. Yeah, you, you had asked um, what could be done ecologically, I guess, to prevent spills, and, and that's the part I was struggling with. I'm not sure ecologically there's anything we can do to prevent spills. I think when you look at, I mean, there's a lot of finger pointing going on now, information's coming out on all the different causes. There were a lot of corners cut. There was lax in oversight, in inspection, a lot of those kinds of things. Uh, I think industry, um, you know, I'm speaking off record, I think got lazy. The regulatory community got lazy, and this was one of the consequences of that. Um, certainly, I, I think technological fixes or, or, or approaches are going to be a, a major component in, in helping prevent or, or reduce the likelihood of, of similar kind of events happening in the future. Um, but from a, ecologically, how to prevent this, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if we can. And I agree. Uh, you know, um, I, would have, I was hoping gasoline would hit $5 a gallon. Okay? I mean, you started seeing gas prices going up. People stopped buying Hummers. You know, why are you buying and driving something that gets 10 miles to a gallon when you can drive something that gets 40? Right there, you're taking that same amount of oil and gas and having it last a much longer time, mm -hmm. thereby reducing your demand. So there are choices that we have to make. I think our, mm -hmm. uh, we need national policy in that direction. We've, we've had attempts at that before, and it's always kind of fizzled for whatever reasons, <coughs> a variety of pressures. Um, 
but I agree, it's, it's personal choices, it's choices that are, you know, our, our politicians and government make. We need to go in that kind of direction. And until we're, we're all willing to, like I said, I, I want to see five, six dollar a gallon oil. And we're going to see conservation going on. You're going to see demand mm -hmm. for oil and gas decline and potentially, uh, you know, lessen the demand for, for offshore drilling for drilling anywhere. Is the secrecy that it occurred during the Gulf oil spill, the present one, really designed to protect the oil companies from, uh, from further uh, financial damage and also to protect uh, their policies? I'll give you one response to that. <laughs> so, and, and no, I don't actually think so, but I, what, what goes on, it, there's a, uh, now in oil spill responses, there's a, a process called NRDA, N-R-D-A, which is Natural Resource Damage Assessment. It's a federal law under which these actions, they're, they're, it allows the trustees responsible for the resources of our, our states and, and the country to seek restitution for damages from oil spills. Uh, and so it's, but it's a very uh, a, a, a legal type of process. And so what I've seen happen, uh, when I first started responding to oil spills 25 years ago and I oversaw them, all, all, the, all the spills that happened in Texas over that period of time, the spill responses were led by what I would call professionals, engineers, biologists, people who actually knew what they were doing in, in that regard to, to try to address spills. Today, and in particularly in this spill, it was totally driven by lawyers in my opinion. And with, with concerns about what were the legal ramifications, how to present this in court or otherwise, and very little in regards to what was actually needed to be done. And that, that put, they put tremendous restrictions on those agencies, EPAs and the NOAAs and other federal scientists. And I talked to many of them off the record, and they, they were just totally frustrated. Things that they know, knew that they should do, but from a legal perspective, they were not allowed to do. So there was clear perception that it would look that way, I think. And so I, I, a great deal of it, I think, was just that. It, it's in a legal process. And that's, that's just an, that's an opinion, too. Everyone can have an opinion. That's my opinion on that one. I'll jump in with a question for Ilza. I was interested that you seemed, or that um, the turtles that were coming in were all small, and or smallish. It seems like all else being equal, uh, the larger turtles should be easier to spot and pick up. Do you know why? Um, not offhand, but it may be in terms of how far the boats were able to go. The, the larger ones may have already been further offshore. And so, the, you know, again, it's just a, a spatial distribution on, on you know, where, where different size classes were at that point in time of year. Mm -hmm. And to Nerda, um, because I didn't know a thing about that regulation before the Gulf spill. And I'm just curious about what, as citizens and you know people who are environmentally informed, what we can do to attempt to sort of change that legislation or make more people aware of it, because I find it kind of abhorrent. Well, I, I don't know if you, I might not agree with you that I find it abhorrent. Nerd is, uh, I mean, how it's prosecuted is, is perhaps needs some addressing, but the actual tool itself is really tremendously valuable in that it's a civil process that really gives great weight to the work or to the assessments that are done by the trustees for natural resources. They make an assessment of what the damage was and their assessment by the courts is considered correct. And the oil companies in this case have to prove that they're wrong. And that's a very powerful position to be in. The problem is how it's, I think it's how it's managed perhaps. But one of the things that you all as citizens have the right to do, an uh, aspect of NERDA is that uh, those individual trustees are fiduciarily responsible for what they do to and, and subject to citizen suits. So basically what that means is, is that they don't do, if the trustees don't do their job and recover fully the damages to those resources, they are subject to lawsuits individually and collectively for failing to do their duty. So that's a, that's a pretty powerful tool. Regarding NERDA also, it, it applies not only to oil spills, but also to um, chemical releases. Um, of, of other types, um, so contaminated hazardous waste sites, uh, Superfund sites, um, those parties that were responsible for those releases are applicable to NERDA. Under the law, the governor of every state in the country is, a, is the federally designated trustee for all the natural resources under state control. Within those states, the governors then can assign that responsibility to some group. and. It varies, and this gets into a lawyer situation. For example, in Colorado, the designated representative for the governor, it's a trustee, is the attorney general's office, the lawyers. 
In the state of Ohio, it's the Ohio EPA, an environmental organization. So different states have different groups within those states that have those assigned responsibilities and what tack they take, what direction they want to go. The intent of the law is to go after whoever was responsible for the spill, whether it's an oil spill or a chemical release from a, a, a chemical processing plant or whatever, and get money to, to be specifically used to restore the injured resource. And that could include groundwater, surface water, soil, biota, and air. Okay? Uh, and that's the intent of the law. It really is a good law. As, as Larry said, after the studies are done, um, injuries are identified, how the resources have been affected, then the lawyers get, really get involved again, mm -hmm. in my opinion, and this is where things really start, start going nuts. Um, you know, in the Exxon Valdez, um, the lawyers there kept everything going for so long. A lot of even the civil lawsuits, uh, folks passed away. Uh, they got tired of 10, 12 years and just dropped the lawsuits. And, and, you know, they had big bucks and, and were able to extend things to, to wait people out. Un unfortunately, um, that's an issue. Uh, I think in the current, in the Gulf, um, the government did order BP to set aside, what was mm -hmm. it, 20 million, um, specifically to have that money sitting there ready to address NRDA claims. Uh, and I don't think that's ever happened before. Now, how quickly those, those funds are going to be accessed to help restore the environment and to restore the resources, that remains to yeah. be seen. But I think that, that was a very positive big step forward. I think we have time for two more questions, and then uh, Alex last. Uh, can you give more details regarding the impact this oil spill has had locally here in Chicago? And uh, there have been um, oil spills here locally in the past. Um, any details on what impact they have had on the environment? Thank you. I know there, yeah, recently there was a, a large spill on, um, in, in a, on the Kalamazoo River right. uh, locally. Um, um, I, I don't know the details on, on the impacts, and, and, uh, but it was a significant amount of oil in a riverine in, I mean, mm -hmm. system um, that extended pretty far. I think they were able to contain it before it did get down uh, towards the mouth of the Kalamazoo River where there's some significant wetland resources mm -hmm. and before it got out into uh, Lake Michigan. Uh, but actual, the, the level of impacts, I, I really, I couldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, from the Gulf itself, I mean, you know, I, in terms of how it's impacted oil prices, I mean, there, there may have been some increases. I don't know in terms of the long economic um, effects on that. I think we are looking at our seafood sources, um, you know, and identifying, you know, you know, what's been impacted. I don't know what prices really have gone or not, but that's all looking at what's available uh, from that standpoint. Um, I don't know if people have changed plans, visitation plans or vacation plans, um, but those are all, again, resources that that area would need. But if we're, you know, we're impacting them more than that, that's really impacting our, us. So those would be, those are sort of the, some of the far-reaching consequences, just some of the food sources, like the sushi bar that Larry mentioned. Um, th those things can Im impact, or, you know, our, our consumer choices will impact that area. I think uh, our final um, question for the evening from, from Alex. Um, so since we still don't know what the impacts are on the environment in the Gulf of Mexico, I was wondering if you had any preliminary figures on what they were on like the local businesses, the fisheries, um, oh, any other businesses? The, the economic impact, in other words. Yes. Uh, no, I think I was at a, a meeting uh, uh, in Alabama uh, last week uh, talking with, uh, and we had panels of, of folks talking about the economic impacts of it, and, and that's, that's being assessed, but it will be in billions of dollars. Uh, in some places, many of those local businesses are, will not survive. Uh, they, one specific example, in Orange Beach, Alabama, they depend typically during the height of their summer season, they have 90% occupancy of their hotels and condominiums and so forth. This year, it's 25%. Uh, so the numbers in that regard, and that, uh, so they're, they're going to be quite high, but this is so large right now that, that we don't, that I'm not aware of a, a number has come up. Okay, well, if we could thank, so I know there are more questions out there, and I'm hoping the speakers will, uh, will hang around the podium for a couple of minutes afterwards, but um, the shed has been extremely hospitable, and we don't want to push them too far. 
we said we'd be out by 8 o'clock. So if we could thank again for three wonderful presentations. <laughs> The World Beyond the Headlines Lecture Series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from the Norman Waite Harris Memorial Fund. Download recordings of other events and learn more about the World Beyond the Headlines series at the Center for International Studies website, cis.uchicago.edu.